Hi, my name is Adam, and today we're going to discuss molecular polarity. Before we do so, though, I want to show you a video here, one that I, we're going to look at Danny's magic powers. So, here's my question for you. Is he just a film editing guru? Does he actually have magic powers? Well, today, you're actually going to figure out how he does this and learn how to be able to do it yourself. And this is all related to molecular polarity. Now, let's take a step back and see where we came from. A little bit ago, we looked at Lewis structures, how to draw them and create them from the molecular formula, and we saw that we could draw them in two dimensions. Then we took a look at their molecular geometries and the Lewis structures in three dimensions. We know that each um, molecule will have a distinctive set of bond angles based on the molecular geometry. And so depending on what type of arrangement there is there, whether it's linear, trigonal, planar, or tetrahedral, that will determine the shape and its bond angles. We also took a look at how electronegativity comes into play when discussing bond polarity. Um, we essentially saw that there, were, there was a spectrum ranging from nonpolar covalent all the way up through ionic bonds. And all of this is based on the difference in electronegativity that is observed between atoms when they are bound together. Today, we're going to look at molecular polarity. And after watching this video and doing the tasks in it, you should be able to determine if a molecule is polar or not using the molecular formula and using Lewis structures. You should be able to do this for organic and non-organic molecules. I'm also gonna help you to find access for tools for viewing these molecules in three dimensions. That makes it much easier to visualize them and see why some things are polar and not. And then in the end, we're gonna discuss why polarity is important. So let's define polarity first. A polar molecule is one that has a negative end and a positive end. We also call this a net charge separation. So to see a little bit what I mean here, let me give you an example. Hydrogen fluoride. There's the negative end and the positive end. And these ends of the molecules correspond to the different elements. They're based on the difference in electronegativity. Because fluorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, it pulls the electrons towards it, creating a negative end. The hydrogen, on the other hand, gives its electrons away, creating a positive end. But what happens if the atoms in the molecule share relatively equally? You get a molecule then that's a little bit more like hexane. There are no ends because it's shared equally. So the question is, how are we going to be able to predict whether or not a molecule is polar? They don't fly around us with these pretty colors. We need a systematic way to determine it. So it's a simple four-step process to determine if a molecule is polar or not. First thing you want to do is draw out the Lewis structure. Then determine what the molecular geometry is. The third step is to identify if there are bond dipoles. Finally, you need to 
add together these bond dipoles to see if there's a net dipole moment. Let me give you an example here. Carbon dioxide. It's in the atmosphere all around us. Here's what its Lewis structure looks like. Its molecular geometry is based on this central carbon. It's linear. Are there bond dipoles? To answer this, we need to determine. The electronegativity of oxygen is much greater than that of carbon, so there are bond dipoles. And we could draw this in like so. Fourth, is there a net dipole moment? So if we were to take these two arrows and lay them right next to each other or on top of one another, like so, we would see that there would be no net movement. If you were to walk back and forth along that path, it's as if you never moved. That's what we call a non, or excuse me, a dipole moment of zero. The bond dipoles cancel, and we get a nonpolar molecule. This is what it would look like if we were to give it the different colors. Notice that there is a difference in the center of the molecule that has a partially positive charge. However, there are no ends that are separate from one another. On both ends, they are both red, indicating that they, there's no net separation of charge. Let's take a look at another molecule, water. Water's Lewis structure looks like the following. Its molecular geometry is bent, and it does indeed have bond dipoles. Electronegativity of oxygen much greater than that of hydrogen. We can indicate them like this. The net dipole on water can be drawn like this, adding the arrows together, and we see that there is an actual net dipole. The bond dipoles do not cancel, and therefore the molecule is polar. We can show this in a couple different ways. One would be to draw the resultant arrow over the molecule. Also, we see its diagram and color like so. And then in, in this case, we see that there is a, a negative region up here by the oxygen and a positive region here. This is one end and that is another end and they have different uh, polarities, one negative and one positive, therefore the molecule is polar. Now that we've looked at this, we can revisit that mysterious video from earlier on. Remember when we saw this, the water bending towards the comb? Well, understanding polarity helps us to understand how this happened. It all has to do with generating a, an electric field or a charge on the comb. What Danny didn't tell us is in advance, he took his comb and probably rubbed it on a fur um, carpet or other um, material that would impart a static charge to the comb. Then the molecules in the water will line up according to the charge on that comb and they would then tend to follow it. If the comb has a negative charge on this end, then the positive end of the molecule will be attracted towards it, and vice versa. So, was it magic? No. It was Danny utilizing principles of electricity and polarity to do an innovative trick on us. Now, it's time for you to practice. You need to now determine if the following molecules are polar. For your help, I'll put up the four steps. At this point, you should pause the video now and practice. You may restart the video after you've gone through and worked these two problems out. Okay, welcome back. I hope that that wasn't too hard for you. I'm gonna now walk you through briefly the process here to see if you got it right. So this first molecule, Lewis structure, 
Its molecular geometry is tetrahedral. It does indeed have bond dipoles. Fluorine is much more electronegative than carbon. In terms of um, the bond dipoles, there they are overlaid on the molecule. And then for the net dipole moment, they do cancel each other out. It's nonpolar. Now, that can be a little bit difficult to see. And if you didn't quite get that, then that's all right. What I would like you to do is go and do a web search for FET, P-H-E-T, and it's a simulator. It's called Molecule Shapes. This allows you to view molecules in 3D to turn them around, and this will help you to see that indeed, in carbon with four hydrogens, carbon tetrafluoride, the bond dipoles do cancel out in three dimensions. One of the inherent weaknesses of drawing Lewis structures on paper is that even if we use the wedges and the dashes to indicate directions, it can be hard to see the full three-dimensional geometry. In order to do that, you really should make some models or to view the simulator. Okay, let's move on to ammonia. Ammonia's Lewis structure looks like the following. Its molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. In terms of bond dipoles, nitrogen is much more electronegative than hydrogen, and so it does have bond dipoles. Can write them in like so. And they don't cancel out. Now again, this might look a little funny. They all kind of are going in towards the nitrogen, but because the hydrogens are beneath the nitrogen, they're not in the same plane, they don't cancel out perfectly. Again, if you're having a hard time seeing this, one of the best things to do, go and view the simulator. Okay, now, why should you care about polarity? Well, some of you may want to be waterbenders, others of you will leave that to the cartoons, but how does polarity apply to us in real life? Polarity actually plays a very important role in many things all around us. Take, for example, soap. Soap utilizes the difference in polarity between the oils on your skin and water, and the fact that soap has both of those, both polar and nonpolar parts, to take and trap the oils on your skin, bind them up in the soap molecules, and let them get washed away in water. Polarity is an essential part of how our DNA works. Polarity allows the DNA molecules to bind together through hydrogen bonding, which allows them to have their unique structure. And finally, and perhaps most important to, to us sometimes, our stomach. Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is an emulsion, which means that it's combined with polar and nonpolar parts but we can make a nice mixture of it that's uniform throughout. Without knowing how to make an emulsion properly and utilizing polarity, our mayonnaise would probably look just like this. Okay, thanks for watching everyone. I hope that this helped you out to understand polarity, how to determine if a molecule is polar, help give you some access to some cool tools to view molecules in three dimensions, and as well, why you should care about polarity. Thanks, and have a great day.